All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remarque. It's a fictional study of social and wartime sentiments set in World War I's famous Western Front. The principal characters are Paul Bomber, the narrator, a German infantryman, Stanislaus Karaczynski, Kat, Paul's older friend and fellow soldier, Krop, Jaden, Hai, Mueller, Kemmerich, and other German soldiers. Remarque's unique novel of World War I trench warfare not only catalogues the grim realities of war, but poignantly describes the spiritual and physical destruction of the youth who are sacrificed in the struggle. Before he was 20 years old, Remarque had fought on the Western Front, and his graphic accounts of death, misery, and the loss of personal ideals ring oppressively true. Undoubtedly, he left this work on the war to end all wars as a testament and a warning to the future. But World War I, as we well know, did not end war. It did usher in a century of deepening disillusionment and spiritual rootlessness that remains part of our legacy even in the technological promised land of the 90s. Because Remarque opposed the Nazi regime and wrote against the party, he was eventually deported from Germany. He came to America, where he became a citizen in 1947. Paul's unit rested not far from the front lines. Half of the unit had been destroyed in an English artillery barrage, leaving twice as much food for the survivors. And Kat, the 47-year-old man fighting alongside seven young kids just out of school, always had an uncanny way of dispensing provisions. No one had to ask where the double rations of food and cigarettes came from. It would not be such a bad war if only one could get a little more sleep Cat complained after the meal. Indeed, sleep had come with difficulty during the first weeks at the front. Kantorik, Paul's old school teacher, had propped up the war as a glorious event. Iron youth sent to repel the foe. Naturally, we couldn't blame Kantorik for this, Paul reasoned. There were thousands of Kantoriks, all of whom were convinced that they were acting for the best in a way that cost them nothing. That is why they let us down so badly. In due time, faced with the true effects of war, even the teacher's wisdom had vanished. What's more, their commander, Corporal Himmelstoss, had ordered them to carry out punishing and cruel drills. They hated him and could no longer trust authority figures in general, thinking themselves more experienced. We were all at once terribly alone, and alone we must see it through. The men went to visit a member of their unit, Kemmerich, who had been wounded in the thigh and now lay in a field hospital. The man's foot had been amputated, but crazed with gangrene and fever, he did not know this. He it is still, and yet it is not he any longer, Paul thought when he saw his friend. His features have become more uncertain and faint, and his voice sounds like ashes. Crop attempted to comfort the delirious soldier. Now you will be going home soon. You would have had to wait at least three or four months for your leave. And Mueller brought him his possessions. Among the articles were a fine pair of leather boots. Mueller tried to negotiate for the boots, but Kemmerich was unwilling to part with them. Once outside, Mueller, carrying the boots, told the group that Kemmerich was done for. On the way back to the barracks, they discussed how the fighting could be ended. Krop joked that his idea would do the job. Give all the generals and ministers clubs and let them personally fight it out in an arena. That would be much simpler and just than this arrangement, where the wrong people do the fighting. Meanwhile, Himmelstoss was making their lives miserable, especially that of Jaden, who had a bladder disorder and wet his bed every night. Himmelstoss tried to correct this by placing another man who had the same problem over Jaden's bunk, then each night reversing the men's position. One evening, finding the corporal drunk, the men crept up behind him and threw a sheet over his head. Using a whip... Each man, Jaden in particular, satisfied his bitter anger by taking a turn in the thrashing. Soon after, Himmelstoss was openly reprimanded for his harsh mistreatment. The men thereafter took bold pleasure in jeering and insulting their leader. Finally, they shipped out to the front. To me, the front is like a mysterious whirlpool. Though I am in water far away from its center, I feel the whirl of the vortex sucking me slowly, irresistibly, inescapably into itself. We march up, moody or good-tempered soldiers. We reach the zone where the front begins. 
and become on the instant human animals. The unit was hit with heavy bombardment. Men, crying out in unabashed fear, crouched inside trenches and shell craters. The screaming of a thousand wounded horses filled the air. Gas fumes choked the soldiers, and those lucky enough to have gas masks waited in fearful silence, wondering if they were airtight. Straightway, the unit found cover was in a graveyard, only to have shells, coffins, and corpses unearthed all around them when the shells pounded down. Finally, the gas dispensed and the shelling ceased. Cat and Paul prepared to perform a mercy killing on a young soldier with mortal wounds to the stomach and hip. Young innocents. Cat murmured before firing the bullet. Later, back at the barracks, the young men began discussing what they'd do once the war ended. Most planned on returning to mundane, ordinary jobs, and Paul, drafted right out of school, had no idea what he would do with his life. Oddly, though, it seemed no one could remember even the most humorous high school prank they had pulled. The war has ruined us for everything, Albert said. Paul agreed. We are youth no longer. We don't want to take the world by storm. We are fleeing. We fly from ourselves, from our life. We are cut off from activity, from striving, from progress. We believe in such things no longer. We believe in the war. As they marched to the next offensive, the company passed stacks of coffins. Each man knew that one of the coffins was meant for him. The front is a cage in which we must await fearfully whatever may happen. One continual round of shelling, gas, and rats. In an effort to relieve their boredom, the men took sport in killing the bold, hungry rats, which had grown huge from feeding on dead bodies. Presently, the rum and cheese rations improved, sure signs of an impending battle. Then the attack came. We have become like wild beasts, Paul explained. We do not fight. We defend ourselves against annihilation. Men blown apart, decapitated, and other horrible scenes flashed across their eyes. Still they advanced, scurrying over mangled corpses, fighting on instinct, killing mechanically without feeling. The French had been driven back. The German company also fell back to the original front lines, gathering up any food they could find along the way. Of the some two hundred men, only thirty-two remained. With the battle over, Paul had time to reflect again. Here in the trenches, memories are completely lost to us. We are dead, and they stand remote on the horizon. We could never regain the old intimacy with those scenes. We are forlorn like children and experienced like old men. I believe we are lost. The remnants of the company rested and found company with some French girls across the river. Swimming to the other side, the soldiers entertained themselves, bribing the girls with gifts of bread and sausage. Paul was soon given a two-week leave. He felt odd about returning home, his companions still at the front. As the train neared his father's home, the scenes became more familiar, bringing back childhood memories. The sound of his sister's voice made him break down and cry. I try to make myself laugh or speak, but no word comes. So I stand on the steps, miserable, helpless, paralyzed, and against my will the tears run down my cheeks. Paul found that the war had changed him so much that he scarcely knew how to behave. Was it very bad out there, Paul? His mother questioned. He wanted to cry out, Mother, you could never realize it, but lied instead, saying, No, Mother, not so very. There are always lots of us together, so it isn't so bad. News came that his mother had cancer. With this sad revelation and the stream of questions asked about the war, questions Paul could not somehow answer, a strange and lonely feeling suddenly fell over him. He felt awkward in his civilian clothes, and his thoughts continually wandered to the front. Leave is a pause that only makes everything after it much worse. I was a soldier, and now I am nothing but an agony for myself for my mother, for everything that is so comfortless and without end. Before returning to the front, Paul paid a visit to Kemrick's mother. In order to spare her the details of his long period of suffering, he lied, telling her her son had been killed instantly. This is where I belong, 
Paul blurted out in emotion upon reuniting with his comrades, most of them still alive. Paul's unit was called into action again. In the ensuing battle, Paul was separated from his group. Panicking and caught in a hail of machine gun fire, he crawled into a hole and buried himself in the mud to avoid detection. When a French soldier landed there too, Paul frantically stabbed him. At first, appalled at the brutality and horror of his deed, Paul shrank from the wounded man. When he overcame his terror, he was filled with remorse and relieved the suffering of the soldier during his last hours. Never having before killed a man face to face, his conscience burned in torment. Every gasp lays my heart bare. When the soldier finally died, Paul addressed the corpse, promising the man he would write a letter to his wife. Paul finally recovered his senses and crawled back towards his lines. There, Cat found him, still in agony over what he had done, and the older veteran assured his weeping comrade that he had committed no crime. The war dragged on. Dysentery, disease, and death dogged the soldiers constantly. One day, while guarding a supply dump, both Paul and Albert were wounded. Paul's leg healed, and soon he began hobbling around the hospital but Albert's leg had to be amputated. Unable to bear his friend's jealous gaze, Paul returned home for a short while to his mother and sister. Again, in a trench on the front lines, Cat was wounded in the knee with shrapnel, and Paul carried him to the rear. When he reached his destination, Cat was dead. He had bled to death, a tiny piece of shrapnel having pierced his head. Grieving and demoralized, Paul affirmed, I am twenty years old, yet I know nothing of life but despair, death, fear, and fatuous superficiality cast over an abyss of sorrow. I see how peoples are set against one another, and unknowingly, foolishly, obediently, innocently slay one another. Our knowledge of life is limited to death. What shall come out of us? Paul was alone. His comrades, one by one, had been killed. Even more than their physical death, Paul shuddered at how they had been spiritually murdered. Rumors circulated that the end of the war was near, but they only served to madden the already disillusioned, weary soldiers, many of whom now stood on the front lines, supported by wooden legs. Paul fell in October 1918, on a day that was so quiet and still, on the whole front, that the army report confined itself to the single sentence, all quiet on the Western Front.